Hi, welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics, Episode 5, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I have a slightly weird panel, but that weird is probably a good thing this evening. Um, we have s ever stalwart Joe Steigerwald, um, of course, my brother, who is an okay person, I guess. And we also have um, Michael Tracy, who is a um, correspondent for Vice, and he's also written some stuff for the American Conservative and The Nation and Reason and other good stuff. So it's exciting to have him here. He's not officially libertarian, but I won't label him anything else because that would be, you know, I sh but we, we like him anyway. Um, and we also have Josh, uh, Joshua M. Patton, a uh, Pittsburgher who I know in real life, and um, he wanted to be introduced as a writer for the internet, which is an incredibly vague introduction, but an accurate one nonetheless. Um, thanks for being on the panel tonight, gentlemen, bearded gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, we had my, you know, I had tailored my, my half ass schedule a little bit more to some more libertarian-centric topics, but it's probably better to branch out a little. Like, I was going to talk about how Ron Paul's totally going to be in the final chapter of At the Atlas Shrugged movie, which I haven't even ever... I haven't ever read or seen any of those movies, but, you know, that's still funny. Um, we're talking about Depressed. Right? Yeah, it's a really long book, and they recast it every time, which is super weird. And it um, gets horrible reviews. Yeah. It, it'll be an embarrassment to everyone. I kind of want to watch it for Ron Paul, though, and for <laughs> many jokes about how it's happening, Doc Giff. Um, <laughs> but that's not important, right? I mean, it is important, but it's also not. Uh, we can talk about depressing things like Obama sending advisors to Iraq because no uh. wars ever started with sending advisors to a foreign country. Um, but we could talk about something a little more of a, an optimistic and good thing, which is that last night the um, House the, the House passed... Um, what looks to be a better step towards NSA reform, such as it is, than the very toothless um, USA Freedom Act that passed, I now forget when, like last month or so. Um, and the new thing is actually intended to, which, you know, ha hasn't passed in the Senate or anything like that, um, but it's intended to cut off funding um, in the NSA's efforts to make various technologies. Um, Michelle Montalvo, better late than never. It's <laughs> hey, I'm on my phone. I yeah. We're doing it live, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Well, at least I'm not the only one without a beard. Michelle, um, are we live right now? Uh, we are. We have no viewers though, so I wouldn't worry about it. Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Um, Michelle Montalvo meets Michael Tracy and Joshua Patton. Hello, Michael Hi, and Josh. Josh. <laughs> hello, hello. All right, I got one more libertarian to back me up here. Well, anyway, gents and lady, NSA reform. Um, it also this all. Ugh. Well, I'm, oh. I'm all over the place today. This is this is this is. I'm gonna problem. leave now, Lucy. <laughs> this is unacceptable. All right, NSA reform, I'm not, okay, here's a really wide, wide question not related to the bill in case we haven't been paying attention or, like me, can't retain enough information to talk about it um, without <laughs> having an article in front of us. Is NSA reform actually a thing that's happening? And even if it does, does it actually matter? Because won't the FBI and the DEA and local police just spy on us all anyway? So is it possible? And if so, how would we go about it? Give me some words on the NSA, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I mean, I definitely think the tech industry has coalesced very strongly behind at least putative reforms. So you've seen, you know, massive PR campaigns waged by Facebook and Google and others to kind of get kind of to, to marshal industry support behind these things. So you'd have to think that the measures, therefore, have some degree of of, of weight to them if these huge economic players are, are going to be are deploying so many resources behind you know lobbying for them so I think that that matters to a degree but you know there are just so many I mean 
law enforcement across the country is just so disparate and disconnected that it's hard to have any kind of comprehensive analysis of what kind of surveillance they're they're implementing. So it's wholly separate from whatever reforms happen on the federal level. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the problem is the just the setup of our government in itself. With you would need state and federal reforms. But I mean, do you guys have any sense of what the best angle? is to try to stop this. I, it's one of those things where I feel sort of immediately exhausted, like there's like, immediately pessimistic about the chances of fixing this. Kind of like whenever war drums start and I'm like, well, if you're going to war, you're going to do it. And there's nothing I can do, which is a bad attitude, but. Well, I, I don't, I don't know about what specific angle you, they might take. Cause again, I don't know enough about like what computery shit is is possible, what isn't, um, but I do think that if there is going to be change, uh, it, it might have a good chance of happening this year, because it is a midterm year, and a lot of, it is a very popular issue. No one really likes the NSA right now. Um, so if they, if, if somehow that were to become uh, a certain group of, of uh, candidates currently in Congress, you know, running for re-election, who, like, their, their uh, constituents make a big deal about it, they might try to do some last minute push something through in order to have a political victory right before the election. And again, whether that ends up having any teeth or being effective, there's really no way to know until, I mean, there's actually no way to know unless another Snowden comes out and says, yes, they did, or yeah, that they didn't. I think the, uh, the public is enough against the, you know, a lot of these bills that I think, you know, it goes back to, you know, Cantor lost in part because he was seen as this kind of statist. And with this new bill, they actually, they do a voice vote before it actually happens to see, um, you know, Congress basically off the record will vote and it didn't pass on the vote, on the voice vote when they actually did the vote, it passed because no one wants to go on the record now being for the NSA because they know, you know, it's political poison at this point. Is it really? I mean, that's... I think it is on the, the conservative side. Yeah. And I, guess I, think, can... I think all over. I mean, liberals themselves love, they love uh, Glenn Greenwald and, and Edward Snowden. They, they, again, this is, these are two guys who have, sort of transcended the the ideological teams that that people you know like it's like it's fucking sports mm -hmm. um it's people seem to care about it however if you know with the the stuff happening in Iraq if anything even sounds like terrorism uh outside of the Middle East is happening related to ISIS or, or really at all um i think that the opinion will change for a lot of people who have typically been on the national security side of things. Another point about kind of the local surveillance measures that are, are being enacted, I think we have reason to believe at this point, and, you know, a few, a few case studies basically reflecting this, that, you know, oftentimes what happens is that law, police departments or other kind of law enforcement agencies will try to usher in these new technologies used for surveillance kind of underhandedly, or, you know, it's not put up for public debate, you know. Like with the stingrays, have you, have you looked into that? Yeah, that would be an example of it. But I, you know, I think, you know, there's evidence in, you know, various locations around the country that when, you know, committed journalists or activists call attention to these actual measures and the amount of money being spent on them and how there's, they seem to be being instituted without proper oversight from the local council or whatever the legislative body is, I think there's, you know, and there's definitely a, an opportunity for people on a local level to, to, to kind of marshal support for for at least applying greater scrutiny to these initiatives, you know, I, th I think Radley Balco has even reported on, you know, local backlash to certain militarization initiatives in certain departments. It's just about creating that the awareness because, you know, police officer, police departments by design will do it without, with you know, pretty little fanfare by bureaucratic mechanisms. So they're not, their decisions aren't subject to, you know, direct electoral oversight. Mm-hmm. So Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys, I believe one of his many uh, campaign platforms when he ran for governor of California back in the late 70s, was that police officers should have to run for office, which I always thought was an interesting idea. Not well, that it would really solve anything. For office. That's true. Yeah, that's true. 
Um, but yeah. Sorry, I had a Joel Biafra related tangent that went nowhere, but that happens in my life. Um, <laughs> I keep I keep wondering if what well, one thing that we don't have, like I don't want to pretend that I trust the Constitution to fix everything by any means, and I think that out of all the Bill of Rights, the Fourth Amendment is probably one of the most destroyed at this point. But part of the problem is that so many of our laws have not caught up with our technology. So many of our computer laws that are used to um, to legalize spying have not have not caught up. And I, I know I should be skeptical about like you know the the magical fix everything about spying law of you know 2016, but I wonder if there's anything there that can actually like like it just needs something that needs to exactly state like you you may not spy on these people, you know, without a really particular warrant or something like that. But I, I, I don't, it's just, just something really basic without the caginess, without the sort of, oh, uh, well, we need more loopholes for this loophole and that sort of thing. I mean, I don't know. Would you really trust the government to actually enforce itself regardless? Well, no, I mean, if, no. if they can get away with it, they're going to get away with it. That's why, mm -hmm. uh, the, hence the pessimism. Hence the right. Pessimism. I mean, it's... Steve, what a, a simple law or directive like that would even look like, because there's just mm -hmm. so much case law already on, on the books governing what kind of surveillance is allowable and when. You're right. Yeah. That to, to over, and that you can't overturn it with even one decision because it's so kind of multifarious. Mm-hmm. And you, you'd probably really have to, the only fix would be to, to totally cut off the budgets of pretty much as many agencies as you can. Well, that's why doing it from a, approaching it from a local standpoint is useful because you can actually narrow down, you know, mm -hmm. what mechanisms are being uh, are being put in place to carry out this the surveillance and you can you can more kind of directly trace the origins of it and uh, and take action that way rather than trying to kind of come up with a uh, yeah, a holistic remedy that you know probably wouldn't be applicable in so many instances. Yeah, that's probably true. It just seems like it's... I, I, I was just hoping for some kind of uh, easy fix. No, I, was I, like, I like some of the weasel moves that have been um, at least theorized, like that, that um, they should cut off the water for the, uh, the, the ginormous NSA compound in... Um, Oh yeah, yeah, where like you know, in about twelve hours, their computers would overheat, and I assume the where are the, to the environmental activists on this one? They finally have a role to play. <laughs> That's true. I, yeah, I saw we... a tweet this week about from environmental activists or you know somebody, someone of that orientation who was you know were planning on doing something like that. I think there are are environmental leaning people who are that had that in the works, but that could that could just me be me conjuring up a false memory. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Um, yeah, I know, like, the 10th Amendment Center, I think, in California was talking about this, people who were trying to, yeah, which, who are not environmentalists, clearly. Um, so we're all doomed. Um, got it. Fourth Amendment's dead, in spite of my shirt. <laughs> cross it off, though. just cross it off. Just start I crossing did. off the amendments. Crossing it off now. <laughs> all right, um, right now we're going to talk a little bit uh, about Michael Tracy's article for Vice about heroin, and I'm gonna ask him to lay it out a little bit, and then maybe the rest of us can uh, join in. Uh, Michael Tracy, can you give us a summation of your article, or I can do it? But um, why don't you give me a couple sentences, and I'll kind of riff from there. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, uh, Tracy was talking about how there has been a bit of a panic lately in various various places about um, an increase in heroin use in the United States. Um, and in other places they have theorized that this increase might be due to um, crackdowns on prescription drug abuse because if you can't get your opiates one way you're going to get them another. But um, basically a re Tracy, a response like it, heroin panic, why is this silly? Um, and you know, is there actually an increase in heroin lately in the United States? Yeah, so one of the contrasts I try to bring out in detail is that we have this kind of sense, at least in the journalistic kind of realm, and especially in the, in the libertarian-leaning realm, that there's been a consciousness shift on drug policy and that people, especially of 
our generation roughly have achieved this kind of enlightened enlightenment with respect to the epic and endless failures of drug prohibition and that going forward we're going to take on a, a more compassionate treatment based approach and move away from incarceral incarceral punishment which everyone knows from every every political per persuasion now pretty much agrees is well the prisons to at enormous expense and not produce anything good and just wrought untold misery on the populace. So everyone agrees that it's terrible. And yet we have right now, even in just the last week, it's been amazing, you know, following this, a number of really punitive criminalization measures that have sailed through state legislatures in New Jersey, New York. New York in particular had a big to do over this past week with Governor Cuomo coming out and supporting it. So it just, you know, just broadly, it seems like there's, you know, the, we see the signs of the emergence of the, this, these, this hysteria that has very distinct echoes of drug scares of the past, like mm -hmm. crack in the in the '80s, um, you know, heroin in the '70s, and those scares, you know, manifested ultimately in horrible public policy. So the point of ca calling attention to this now is to kind of preemptive uh, preempt some of the, uh, the 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 wrong headed policy that seems to be uh, seeping its way in, 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 into inaction. And one of the ways that this, you know, and I also go into the piece, you know, these policies are generally justified by proponents on the basis of there being a quote heroin epidemic in the country, mm -hmm. which is always vaguely defined by people who are referencing it. And uh, also that, you know, we need this to help us this, to save the children, the classic trope. Always. Right. Um, but so this is doubly ironic because just about a week, it was last fr Friday, so a week ago today, the CDC, which is the, the U.S. government's authority on public health data, released its report for heroin, for dr uh, opiate use in 2013 showing that use of heroin among teenagers in the U.S. declined, I think it was 0.6% from 2011 to 2013. So by no, by no uh, you know, meaningful metric can one state with any certitude that there is a heroin, quote, epidemic, especially among U.S. teens in the country, and yet the supposed epidemic among U.S. teens is the primary reason why all all these uh, enforcement measures are being ramped up at this at this time. So you have in New York, they've doubled the size of the anti-narcotics uh, division of the state police. In um, in New Jersey, there was a huge uh, sweep uh, of a, basically basically a mass arrest in the first week of June of over 340 people, 280 of which were just heroin users only. And then their names and and and, uh, and photos and places of residence were splashed on the internet, and it basically Lovely. is a means yeah. of public humiliation. Yeah, I, I talk about this more in a forthcoming piece for Monday, but this is um, so. There's just a lot going on right now, and I feel like it's happening. It's really consequential and significant, and going to have a huge impact on a lot of people's lives. And yet, the journalistic crowd seems insufficiently attuned to it. So I'm trying to... Well, I mean, the, 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 the mainstream press has never been good on the drug war until, you know, like, the mainstream press is bad on, on, on actually questioning policies that are already in place, and they're easily swayed by, you know, the opportunity for a delightfully scaremongery uh, headline. So, I mean, I don't expect uh, mainstream people to question this, the, the fact that there's, you know, totally an epidemic of heroin. Yeah. They always, the, I mean, that's just what they do. They're culpable, they're greatly culpable for the drug wars, horrors as well, because they... Yeah, and, and in generally, they're extraordinarily deferential to law enforcement authorities just oh, yeah, overall, yeah. but with respect to drugs, illicit drugs in particular, law enforcement receive even more deference because they're thought of as having unique experience and expertise on the subject of drugs, which to me is just wildly ridiculous. As opposed to a vested interest in a particular side most of the time. Among other, yeah, but you know uh, they, problems. you know they, and they, uh, you know, even as 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 young kids, you're prop, you know, we're propagandized with the Dare program and so forth, and you know, parents are instilled with the idea that police 
to be educating children about the nature of certain substances when, you know, and I mentioned this in the piece and I, I spoke to a law enforcement person directly about it, the question I had was why are you in particular suited to speak about a purported heroin epidemic, which you're calling a medical issue, to kids at the high school that we were at for like a seminar or the assembly thing, you know, why is it you that's coming and, 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 and giving these kids information when, you know, a reasonable person might say, you know, have a public health official or an academic or a medical professional or someone who actually has a non, can actually discuss this through a non-criminalization prism. Mm -hmm. And, and people are so kind of, kind of entrenched in that mindset that it just seems natural to them that the police should be the ones coming in to provide educational you know, guidance to, to teenagers on, on heroin use when, when really it just, that's the a absolute opposite of what should be happening. Right. I mean, but for the past 40 years have, have made that sort of expected. Um, we can open this discussion up a little bit. Another thing I want to add um, is that I, I, I've sort of, I've, I've talked about kind of what um, Tracy wrote about in, in some other pieces myself, but it was mostly a general caution that um, I think, you know, y'all libertarians and, and, you know, good leftists and anyone else against the drug war, like, I worry about getting too comfy. Oh, weed's legal in two states. You know, we're done. Uh, sitting back. And, you know, not only is it not over for the people who are still in prison for, reason, for reasons they shouldn't be, but it's not over in 48 states about weed. And it's not over about the harder drugs that... Some people are much more uncomfortable, you know, defending. Yeah, it's going in the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd that's right. I'd be curious just to know if anybody has like just any broad reactions to that my soliloquy then, or if they have any kind of <laughs> input or any of their um, experiences that relate to it. Well, I I, I remember uh, back when Philip Seymour Hoffman died is when I started noticing a lot of heroin epidemic stories, mm -hmm. and um, the one thing that that the statistics that I remember floating around was something like, you know, 40, 45 percent uh, increase in overdose death, overdose deaths um, for like a five year period. And um, the, also that where these were happening, the geography was different than what the DEA was used to, which is sort of how I think it got branded an epidemic, because it is. It, it does seem to be popping up in other places, probably, I think, because of the whole prescription drug thing. Um, it's that, spreading to white people, so now there's... Right, a exactly, and that's why it's an <laughs> epidemic now. Holy shit. Um, but I do think... White suburbia. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my, what I think that... that uh, and that's why I think that the law... Like, that they're having success with sort of... Um, cracking down and militarizing and stopping the bad guys because again the heroin dealers you know even when you're having the arguments about legalizing marijuana in the other 48 states you know part of the defense is always well I mean it's not like it's a heroin or it's a heroin drug and I think that if, if somehow that could be detached that fear from the actual realities of you know what it's like and, and what it's like to the people who r really have a problem with it, then people will change their minds about the, that they should be in jail rather than, you know, a hospital or treatment or, or whatever, you know, a wood cabin out in Walden mm -hmm. Pond, whatever, wherever you should go when you're uh, in the grips of the, the girl. What I just read on this, this heroin stats was the... It, the heroin overdoses has not increased since the you know late 90s. It's heroin use has increased by about 50 percent, but the actual overdoses, you know, what I just read on the Huff Post, you know, you search for heroin now and you get an entire page full of like you know panicked headlines and you know heroin's coming to kill us all, et cetera, et cetera. But the actual, it doesn't look like, you know, the deaths, unintentional death overdoses are flat. And it's probably, you know, in cases like this, a lot of the time it's just more people actually admitting that they're doing heroin, not necessarily 
an actual increase. Yeah, I mean, her heroin tends to stay, use has tended to stay very stable for a very long time. Um, you don't see the dramatic spikes. And I don't know, I don't have good numbers in front of me, but if it's true that cracking down on prescription drug abuse and probably, you know, just use, and that's another whole other problem, if it's true that that has pushed people, including, you know, white college students who might have had a pill problem, into heroin, that also is an old story because invariably when the government cracks down on one substance use, people will find another one. And often it's a worse one. Um, like during the Vietnam War, the, when, when sol soldiers, you know, getting stoned um, and they cracked down on marijuana and they started using heroin and they cracked down on heroin and they started uh, injecting it instead of snorting it. Um, and the coke, you know, the coke ep epidemic in the 80s was, was partially um, a reaction to the fact that there was a heavy Reagan era crackdown on marijuana. Like it's at this point, we should we should we should be learning that whenever the government cracks down on a substance, obviously that doesn't end substance abuse or use. It simply pushes people towards something else, which almost every occasion that I've seen is something worse. So yeah, and whatever. Yeah, and there's and I mean I think based on my understanding of the most recent data, and this is the federal government's data, heroin use has remained flat. But there's some evidence. There's evidence that just suggests, and you know, the spokespeople say this, that heroin deaths have increased over the past few years. Now, the irony in that would be that the cause of the death would have not been due to heroin itself, as is, you know, pharmacologically. It would be because it was, you know, it was com combined with some other substance. That was the that was the cause of C Philip Seymour Hoffman's death. That's right. Yeah. Your heroin overdose. It was that his his stuff was laced. So that arises only because it happened. It has to, uh, you know, operate in an underground market, and it can't be subject to any kind of, you know, above ground, you know, Standards. regulations or, or oversight or scrutiny or however you want to put it. Mm -hmm. And I think you know the the Philip Seymour Hoffman thing is 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 interesting, and I mention it in another piece coming out next week because I think it kind of typifies how people approach this issue, which is that they they kind of collect a series of anecdotes about what's going on and 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 that and they form their opinion based on that which is a very you know common human impulse mm -hmm. but when you're when it translate when you're talking about public policy responses to have your your kind of view informed so heavily by you know, anecdotal account of a celebrity dying, and then a law enforcement officer gives his, his anecdotal account, and then you talk to somebody else whose cousin died from it, and it becomes this like self-reinforcing bubble, where people kind of, you know, it's a it's a it's a loop, and people now have such these you know uh, staunchly believed, staunchly held beliefs in the existence of a heroin epidemic. And no amount of data really could dissuade them from it. So thus, they're a little more likely to support wrong-headed uh, public policy. And there's also another problem that the, just the data is all coming from the government. Mm -hmm. So, and because there's no really other entity that can collect data on that scale, or at least does collect data on that scale that I've seen. So, you know, even by the own the government's own data, the, there's no heroin epidemic among teens. And even if, but that aside, there's such little uniformity among the, you know the the sources of data that it just kind of calls into question whether you know we trust the methodology of these sources enough to be making public health pronouncements based on or you know there's, there's a lot of you know just kind of a there's a there's a problem with that as well so there's there's more to go to touch on yeah, ladies I mean, and gentlemen oh sorry go ahead. I was going to say going back to what you said before about you know one cracking down on one thing causes another you know. The government knows they have the data, even if it is faulty. They know that they've been cracking down on you know prescription pills, and as prescription pill use has dropped, the heroin use has you know increased basically in kind. Mm -hmm. So you know it's just one of these things. They know how it's you know working, why it's increasing, and yet they're still you know going to come out with these stupid wrong-headed policies, which is just going to send them to something else, be it meth or Crocodile or you know, whatever else. <laughs> yeah, and know. speaking of overhyped uh, drug terrors, uh, Crocodile was another great one. That one disappeared quick. Yeah, and that was, I mean, that existed 
because people couldn't get their drug of choice in Russia as well. It's it's the same old shit all over the world. And what, what, what pisses me off about the drug war is that suddenly it's become socially acceptable among mainstream politicians to dip a toe into legalization, medical marijuana, or maybe a little less, you know, uh, ridiculous police state shenanigans. But they're still going to take forever to turn around on this. See, and it's, I, I we're still going to... Oh. Well, I, just say, I don't think that anyone ever really turned around. I mean, you, you had you had the Bush years, and and people just it was it, it's a political issue, of course. You know, so Bush's DEA they were raiding the poor uh, medical marijuana stations, and that's messed up. And then the wire ended, and people were you know, and and people loved the wire, and it was about the drug war, and and then you get Obama, who's like, yeah, the drug war is bullshit. And then he comes in and he does the exact same stuff. And now the Republicans, because it's polit politically convenient for them, are, you know, damn the drug war. Not because they want to legalize drugs, but because, you know, they want to stick it to Barry. And that's, that's the problem. No one actually cares yeah, about know, the prohibition part. That's mostly, I mostly agree. Yeah. An interesting trend, in, in, an interesting rhetorical trend among the Republicans specifically, and I think... Chris Christie's a good emblem for this, just because he's considered at the forefront of you know Republican kind of discourse, is that they they've kind of come to accept that railing on social issues, quote unquote, you know, namely gay marriage and abortion, is not always the most the winningest electoral strategy. So they kind of have to adopt other quote unquote social issues to expound on that you know will be emotionally resonant and will you know you know. Uh, you know, touch a certain chord among a certain voter that they, that other that gay marriage and abortion previously had, and you know Christie Christie for since 2012 now has been saying that the war on drugs is quote a failure, mm -hmm. and within the past couple of months, and he did this just today when he addressed the the uh, faith and family freedom f and something coalition <laughs> meeting. Uh, where you know a third of the speech is basically devoted to how the Republican Party gets fixated on these hot button so-called social issues when he thinks that you know compassionate conservatism and the a genuine focus on social issues to, should extend to you know offering treatment offering treatment to to addicts and basically he's saying a drug policy should be the Republicans' new social issue. Um, and of course, that's going to manifest in different ways according to the politician. But it's just the rhetorical trend is itself interesting because Christie's mm -hmm. kind of calculated that you know he can't obviously be seen as this anti-gay rights style word or anti-abortion, but he needs to he needs to kind of rouse that same kind of impulse in people. So he's doing that by kind of bringing a new a new social is issue into the foray, which is interesting. Well, I That's think, a... too, that the, the rise of drug courts, the, you know, the, the popularity of drug courts in the past 20 years that, you know, emphasizes treatment over incarceration. Drug courts are bullshit, scale. though, too. <laughs> Fair I enough. Mean, I mean, we, we've true. talked about this, but uh, I do, it's, but it, the, the focus is not on jail. It's on no, but healing. It's, it's not, it but it the, the rhetorical focus is not on jail, but in practical, in, the practical yeah. impact Oh, yeah, is yeah that's what we're talking about. I mean, you can still ruin a life, life right? in those like if you're more life, feel good you're... measures. So that actually makes it more pernicious that people are talking less and less about incarceration and criminalization while simultaneously ramping up those policies because it makes people less aware that it's happening. Right. So at least when there were fire brands like Dan on it. declaring the war on drugs over when you know it's like in 2009. Let's not call it the war on drugs anymore. The war on drugs was, I mean, the war on people, the war on poor people, the war on black people, the war on Fuck all y'all if you get caught would be slightly more accurate. But the war part was really quite literal quite often. And so the fact that the former drug czar, you know, thought it sounded too, it sounds too mean to call it the war on drugs, we won't call it that anymore, is it actually it annoyed me more just for the reasons that Tracy said, because it, it it's false. It's hiding the, the truth of the, that there's still all of this coercion involved and all of this social engineering involved.
Well, I mean, you can imagine someone saying, you know, I'm a Republican governor of a, of a of one of the most populous states in the country. I personally believe that the war on drugs has failed, but given the exigencies of my duties as chief executive of the state, I have to carry out certain elements of the drug war just as a matter of practical necessity. So that would be that would be at least defensible in a sense. But, yeah. what, but, but in terms of but 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 not if you're simultaneously ramping up drug war initiatives. Because yeah, I mean, yeah. Christie could be like maybe trying to blunt the, the blunt the emergence of more of them. But what he's doing is now authorizing, you know, police initiatives to round up users, put them on the internet, and subject them to public humiliation and and, and arrest them. I mean, that's not that that's the total opposite of what someone who would genuinely believe the drug war had failed would do. Absolutely, the public humiliation well, wait, no. angle is is also. But I mean, other police departments are doing that because they're. I mean, they're. For whatever reason, law enforcement feels like it needs to be on fucking social media, and I don't understand it. it never, and they do so poorly at well it, too. Because <laughs> I, I remember a story where they did that same thing, uh, Tracy, about um, – but it wasn't with drugs. I think it was with prostitution sting. They, yeah, they dealt with child yeah, yeah, yeah. porn stings and stuff. Yeah, yeah shaming so people. Like, it, locking up people is enough. Shaming them is also what, what – um, And I, uh, I think it's – I think it's because they're bitter because there's so many videos online of them fucking, you know, citizens up, and people yeah. get mad at that, and people are starting to wake up to the fact that, you know, just because they're cops doesn't mean they're good, and and that's that's changing the, the dynamic again slightly. Um, you know, there's still a long way to go in terms of actually having people think rationally about how the, the police should act in their communities because – they want to be protected. They want to be. They want to feel safe, and that you know none of the bad, scary brown people are going to get them. And and guys, I don't know. That's right. where I, I get depressed. I, I, yes, I would talk about the drug war and the cops all day long, but then we would have a truly unwatchable podcast that was hours <laughs> long, and we can't do that. We cannot do that. Um, we were going to talk about some. Okay, well, what? We're not going to talk about how the Pope likes the war on drugs, um, some hippie he turned out to be. We're not going to talk about how Hillary Clinton did or did not defend a rapist, which is or is not terrible slash a bullshit pointless story. Um, honestly, I think that we need to wrap up with – now, I, 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 I got I to change this up a little bit because if I had you know a lazy libertarian panel, I could just allude to uh, – what we're talking about without too much context, but basically the last two days, a very silly, very irritating uh, libertarian site that was supposed to be devoted to viral content oh. made a list of the <laughs> made a I list mean, of um, said. <laughs> sexy libertarian ladies, and then when people were annoyed, made a list of sexy libertarian males, which I accidentally helped with, but I didn't mean to because I didn't realize that my friend was talking to the person who made the list. But the point is. I guess I want to talk about since this isn't libertarian centric, but like I don't I don't know. Uh, Joe, well first first of all, Joe, to tell us about those lists a little bit. Um, being a libertarian and person who's always telling me to sell out more so that I get more attention for my pieces. Do you have thoughts on these lists, Joe? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's Austin Peterson who created the site. Whatever, I don't, Liberty Viral, Viral Liberty, whatever it is. Yeah, he's smart. The problem is he's really smart about this, and he knows how to get people to do things for him. You know, he makes this list of the 20 best-looking libertarian females, and he he knows they're all going to retweet it and post it on their Facebook wall, and then there's going to be, you know, a lot of haranguing and, you know, harumphing amongst the other lady libertarians who didn't make the list and you know, it's going to be a huge thing and you know, I'm sorry, I'm good. he knew it was going to happen and it worked out exactly like he wanted to and his before failing Liberty Viral site probably got its most hits ever because oh, people like Kathy Reisenwitz and Michelle Fields took the bait. I mean it was just it was too obvious. It was, it was too really obvious. By him, but it was just it makes me want to puke. <laughs> well is it I mean all of us here are good writers, by the way. Like, do you guys feel a pressure to ever engage in, like, really, maybe not this clickbaity or this sort of narrow of a niche, but, like, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, 
I, you know, the, the one good thing about uh, the libertarian community, it seems, is that you guys do look into each other. So there is kind of a, a you know, a built-in following, not built in, but like it, it's a community. Whereas the rest of us who write just regular shit, I mean, I, every day I have to think, what's the most fucked up headline I can make? that people will click on and share be like, how dare they? And then read an actual reasonable art article and be disappointed and let down. Um, so that's what I do. I mean, I've, I, and I even tried for this one site that I write for latest.com because uh, it's mostly liberal audience. Um, I started, I tried, I did a, like a five craziest things said this week on the right. And usually it was shit like tornadoes caused by gay people. Um, you know, Obama is, a, a Kenyan Muslim transgender, you know, just crazy stuff True. like that, thinking it was and it was straight clickbait. Like, I, I was giving these people, you know, the best thing to do is to ignore those people, and it was, they were some of my more popular pieces in the beginning. I stopped doing it because I don't care for my job as much as I used to, but... <laughs> I mean, it's um, just, the thing is, and I, I've been calling it, I tried to call attention to this two years ago or so, and you know was told basically to shut up by a number of people, but I I kind of prophesied that the quote unquote Buzzfeedification of the internet was at that point already underway, yeah. and we see it now trickling out into realms that we wouldn't have would not have predicted to even two years ago or a year ago. To the point where now that you have a libertarian group emulating the list kind of vehicle for click generation, and it's you know. It just causes controversy. But the other well, thing is, like, the libertarian community, quote-unquote, and I hate that word, community, <laughs> but whatever – what, the libertarian community is very, notoriously kind of inward-looking and always mm -hmm. trying to sort out <laughs> who's a libertarian, who's doing the right libertarian <laughs> thing, who made this other libertarian I have that, never heard this critique before. That. That Whereas I think on, think the, on the left, there's less of this obsession with – or at least, you know, on the on the on the putative left, there's less of this obsession with who is who ascribes to what kind of ideological label. Just because in the past, Feminists, so much on the other hand, fighting on the left that they've kind of renounced that style yeah. of, of infighting. But feminists, Tracy, uh, have the sa very same type of ideological um, testing and sort of I forget what the horrible Maoist self self criticism thing happening. Um, and libertarians, from the inside, it seems like um, libertarians are the very worst at this, or the very best at this. And because they, you know, have so little success in the real, real world, the fact that they spend any time on this at all is sort of, you know, particularly embarrassing. Um, yeah, I mean, I find I find it especially objectionable to make that list. And obviously, the person who 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 made it and knew this going into it and knew that it would provoke controversy, as you know, Joe said, but. You know, the, the people on that list are people who are doing work, you know, doing political analysis or reporting, or they're putting a part of themselves into the public arena that is wholly distinct from their physical characteristics. So to drag that in, in the form of a list just to generate clicks, I think should be, you know, I think it should have been denounced among the, the women, that, women that were on the list if they consider themselves any kind of feminist or even progressive-minded. You don't not even have to consider themselves a feminist. It's just it's de demeaning whichever way you, you spin it. Yeah, but I mean, like, it, it's just it's again catering to the worst impulses of the internet. And if anything, that needs to be fought against because it's so alluring. But Can any of you guys read the comments? I, I tried not to. <laughs> There's no way they weren't going to comment on it though. They knew, like, yeah. I mean, Peterson knew who he was targeting. Well, no. What what bothers me? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that what what bothers me is the polite thank yous about being included on the list, um, Ooh, which some I... of them did and some of them didn't. But um, honestly, like Kathy Kathy Reisenwitz, who I like in real life, and I don't want to pile on some of the silly critiques that she's gotten. But her response was sort of like, "Well, this is demeaning, but it helps me get sort of attention for my career." <laughs> Right. Which is maybe commendably honest, but at the same time, it reminded me of this one Onion article: um, "Everything a woman does is now, everything a woman does now empowering." And talks about how shopping and gaining or losing weight or like doing all the, everything a woman does is now empowering, which is like a really brutal critique of third wave feminism, where 
yeah, you know, choice is choice is top tier and should be for a libertarian in particular. But like, does that really end the discussion? And if so, what's the point? It's like when I read a Jezebel article that basically defended plastic surgery for any reason whatsoever. Yeah, you chose it. Congratulations. But what's you know what's the point of Jezebel if it's if it's just you could have stopped right there. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think, you know, libertarians talk a lot about wanting to be more inclusive and wanting to penetrate different demographics, aside from just white people who tend to be the ones that comprise 95% of the attendance of their conferences, mm -hmm. not more. So I think the fact that this kind of stuff – so this if, – if, if this happened among like a feminist – in feminist circles on the, on the left, it would have caused a huge uproar. There would have been like Twitter ostracizations. People would have, you know, there would have been long, long uh, reflective think pieces written on what happened, et cetera. Whereas among the libertarian circle, because it's kind of more rarefied and it's more insulated, it's just kind of like there's maybe one, one or two people chime in, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna turn into anything that actually prompts any degree of genuine self scrutiny upon the part of the movement, quote unquote. So I think it's kind of just I think the dynamics at play there and the fact that people are kind of consider it acceptable or justifiable to basically you know I don't like tossing around the feminist buzzwords that much mm -hmm. but you know it is an objectification of, of women to say that they're you know they're they're hot and they have to be libertarians like here's a list and I think the dynamics that kind of went into the reaction to the to the, to the, the list kind of the get, to the, get to why libertarians don't appeal much to women and to other demographics and that, they're, that they've been trying to reach out to. I mean, from what I saw, the, the men were a lot more upset than the actual women who were on the list. You know, I didn't hear a single peep from any of them about, uh, you know, maybe this was, you know, a bad list. Yeah, you could see them not wanting to be, you know, they could, they could might, might not want to be think, thought of as whiny or want, you know, petulant about it. So you could see there being kind of a pressure from that angle. Yeah, I mean, I saw them. If, if the people not kind of on the diplomatically list, ignored it, <laughs> which I appreciated. Um, in order to, like, any inroads to be made, someone on the list would have to say something. Because, you know, if the 29th person who didn't make the list says something that's going to be, oh, you know, sour grapes, you didn't get on the list. <laughs> like, I mean, somebody should have stepped up and, Next you know, year. it should have been... And this is just wow. something, I mean... It's, it, it's a no-win situation, really. For I, yeah, the, that's why... Right. emotional those gals are, let's be honest. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> so true. And a anybody would just have to admit that this is an issue that would never... It would never even occur to men to even have to grapple with at all. So yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is definitely disproportionate on, on women. And you don't have to be necessarily a feminist to acknowledge that, but you mm -hmm. have to, I think, just acknowledge reality in that there's this, this disproportionate burden that, uh, burden that women writers are being shouldered with that they're they're even in this conversation to begin with without, you know, voluntarily entering it. Right. Like the, the fact that they – I assume that women didn't all give permission for multiple Facebook photos to be used on this list. And the fact that the male follow-up list um, – was written by basically written by Peterson, a heterosexual, and it had more. You know, there was there was sort of an implied joke that that, that they yeah. were doing a follow up mail list at all. You know, right. so that the women don't get too offended, and so that we're equal. Now, like there was now because I never am going to get that time back. I'm not going to read either of these lists. Good but man. <laughs> what were the male ones? Were they actually? Like, did they just take 20 libertarians that they liked and said, this guy's hot, and talk about – I can't imagine they talked about anything, but really, just other than here's the pictures and you see It was just the tongue-in-cheek. The yeah. male thing was just tongue-in-cheek, whereas the women one, you could actually tell, you know, some thought went into ranking you genuinely based on how hot they thought they were. Yeah, like like the one I – mean, Nick the Gillespie one was number two in the male list, right? So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, um, I, I'm not saying he's not an attractive man, but for like <laughs> among amongst the young liberty crowd, I don't think the ladies are gonna necessarily, you know, be falling over well, themselves for him at number two. That's as someone who's... Oh, go ahead, Lucy. Was... Okay, well, I mean, it comes back to like uh, one of the more interesting and like flawed feminist books I ever dabbled in was um, *Female Chauvinist Pigs*, which was written in like the mid aughts at the at the peak of like, oh God, they're making thongs for six-year-olds, what do we do, sort of panic. And the book is kind of down on um, sex workers, which I strongly dislike, but it raises an, like, an interesting point about this sort of um, 
the sort of box that women get put into, which to me applies in the you you have to laugh when you get put on a list like this sort of thing. Like if if you if you make too much of a comment about it, you're not one of the boys. Yeah. And the boys are gonna sort of they want you to run with them, but they also want to talk about your 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 tits basically. And and that's the box that you're put in. And they want you to put up with it and not get not you know, object at all. Yeah, because you're not like those well, uptight other bitches, basically. To be to be fair, tits are fantastic, and and I'll talk about them all day. That's but my fine. point is, my point is, what what who is this for? Is what I don't understand. Like, is it meant to attract, you know, people like me who who just you know, you know, I like the whole legalized drugs things. Still kind of cool with the Department of Education, like us people. <laughs> it's, so meant it's, to it's meant to attract the. Us? Or is it hardcore trying to be libertarian? Like, yeah, right. it's, it's, it's a circle jerk of outrage. Right, it's meant to attract people. anyone who would brainlessly click it. I mean, it's not. I don't think it's. Yeah. It's it might be like loosely aimed at a libertarian libertarian demographic, but the point of viral content is that you want people to just instinctively click on stuff, whatever their predispositions. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, he wants the uh, Austin Peterson wants wants to be the libertarian with you know Buzzfeed, so. You know, all the libertarians are going to click on this, and, and, I mean, and another, even like, the women, because they're going to be. It's all going to get retweeted by the people on the list, and then yeah. other women are going to see it, and they're going to be, oh, am I on this list? Because it's a small group <laughs> to anyway. Be fair, I get way more retweets and Facebook shares of people who think I'm an asshole than actually are like. Hey, that does help. <laughs> I mean, the buzzfeedification of of media, which which Tracy referenced like a hundred years ago in this debate, mm -hmm. and which we should wrap up soon. Um. Another thing that comes out of that, though, is 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 I don't know if Buzz, Buzzfeed has ever officially said this, but basically, the um the cat gifts are subsidizing you know their occasional forays into actual journalism, including long form stuff. And some of it's dull, but some of it is actually quite good. Um, it was better when Michael Hastings was alive and stuff. But they're still they they have some his, solid longer content on there. Great, by the way. I'm sorry. His new book, the last magazine. I read it in a night. It was really good. Oh, yeah. I want to pick that up. I mean, is there something, though, to be said about um, subsidizing, propping up the the, the, the stuff, the, the long form or the in-depth or the investigative stuff with really silly viral bullshit? Yeah, I mean, st I mean, that's the way media is operated for eons, right? I yeah. mean, classified sections of newspapers are what subsidize the reporting, you know, in, in, in decades past. Um, and you know, because the the reporting aspects of a newspaper is not what generated any revenue. It was you know selling ads and, and classifieds. So but I think that's, service. that's similar not to actively... Buzzfeed now, but just for a yeah. different kind of dynamic. And I think the thing the difference is that it kind of it morphs the general conception of what journalism is in a way that the classified section in a newspaper wouldn't have, because there was this understood separability. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ethos of BuzzFeed is, first of all, they want to do all the journalism has to be abide by the, the mantra of no haters, okay, which, which is, is why you know they got you know, they were castigated for launching a book review section that would right, have no right. negative book reviews. And I think you know there's <laughs> definitely on occasion, on occasion they'll they'll do some journalism that has merit and is and is you know appropriately critical. But at the same time, you have to kind of be cognizant of that, you know, lingering behind it is this ethos that's been mandated from the top CEO on down of doing the, of producing this airy, light, kind of easily clickable content that does you don't want to bump people too much out of about. So right. that, and I think when, yeah. when, when that becomes a major consideration with the journalism you're producing, it has problematic implications. And I think it's you know I think I think the way that the BuzzFeed is kind of diluting the journalistic market is really I mean, and I was sounding the alarm on this like two years ago when I realized it was fruitless and I didn't want to be, you know, be pegged as like a BuzzFeed obsessive. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's going to get you more now. Sorry, you were really mad at BuzzFeed for a minute there. I remember that. And I was yeah, like, I oh, Tracy, like, what are you complaining about? Out. I mean, I feel like I, well, everything I predicted has come true. Like not to, and I, I wish it hadn't, but I feel like it really did. But arguably, it's still better than if there was no long form anything. I mean, I don't know. Or and and all writing and journalism had to be done for free. I mean, I get paid <laughs> from a clickbait site. 
And, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. And and again, th- what I do is, like I said, I I try to do a terrible headline. You know, things like white privilege, real or crazy, and then hopefully. <laughs> People read it and go, oh, shit, he thinks it's real, and he's being nuanced. And by that time, the site's <laughs> made their money, and maybe someone keeps reading and sweet. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But the other thing is that, like, you know, you know, this happens on Vice every now and then, and other, other, other articles can blow up, not because they're listicles or they're, they, or they're you know, um, you know, a funny gif or they have a sen- stupidly sensational headline. It's because they're actually good content. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that still does draw a lot of clicks. I mean, yeah, you have to kind of tailor it to social media in, in, in a sense because, you know, you 95% of the traffic is coming from Facebook. Mm-hmm. But 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 the the, the, the the harm that BuzzFeed has done is kind of inculcated this belief that in order to be successful, you have to adopt their formula, whereas right. there are other formulas available that are more conducive to producing quality content. Yeah, like the, the day that GIFs started being put in the content of other blogs, like on, um, what am I thinking of, like The Gloss, which is sort of a Jezebel-esque, but sometimes less annoying lady blog, and, and, it's like, <laughs> and like Jezebel also, like any kind of, even like glossy other stuff where they put GIFs in the actual body of the piece, and it's, I mean, it's, it's expanded into other places. That, that was a bad sign to me, because again, if... if like a, a BuzzFeed list that is truly just like a bunch of stupid gifts and two sentences, at least you know exactly what that is. When yeah, that creeps about... into more, more text-heavy stuff that also like needs a gif in it, that starts to annoy me. The other thing that the other thing that you know, what, what part of what was informing my critique back in the day of BuzzFeed is that I I kind of discerned. Sit back, that, Tracy. We don't want to see your forehead. Yeah, what, what I discerned <laughs> was that there they. They were kind of personifying the objectivity doctrine, but for a, a, a new tech savvy generation, right? So they they're not they're not supposed to come down on on either side of a political issue. They're supposed to remain impartial. They're supposed to they're focused on the virality of of, of their content, and 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 that's paramount. So they they have to it's a, it's a, it's an offshoot of the New York Times objectivity, but just marketed as as fresher. Whereas that actually makes it more pernicious because you're kind of popularizing it among a new demographic who might think that they're, you know, they're, they, they've transcended the old kind of stodgy objectivity of the past, but in reality are just kind of affirming it in another incarnation today. But right, objectivity is also bullshit, guys, right? I mean, oh, it, right, that's, Lord, right. that's a whole other thing, guys. Right, that's, that's, my, yeah. that's, that's the point of my criticism. That it's yeah, we, we should, God, we should start an entirely media SaaS, SaaSing based podcast. That would actually be really good. Um, Call it, it can be, be called Dr. Wall talks about the media and what she says will melt your heart. No, it won't be called that. Joe, do you have final words on this? So, and uh, uh, I'm going to wrap up. It's been... It sounds like I've hated BuzzFeed for not even as long as Michael Tracy, so that's impressive. I'm glad that there's <laughs> someone else out there who also feels the way I feel. I mean, it literally, I refuse to click on it. I refuse to get to it. I hate Andrew Kuzinski. I hate Ben Smith. Like they're all, they're literally. It's like they're. I mean, I'm gonna get in trouble. With We're all gonna get in trouble. It's fine. Like, I mean, it's. I mean, they're. It's fine. It's the future of news, but. We're all doomed. Yeah. It's it's our you know it's people's own fault. We're the ones clicking on so it. So much money, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is people's own fault. And, um. Well, I mean, I, honestly, like the most optimistic thing, like takeaway from this to me, might be that you, you could sneak in a solid piece underneath a sort of uh, headline. But I don't want to do yeah. that either. Like, I legitimately am going to fail at journalism because because of how much I don't want to have a headline that tells me tells you how you're gonna feel about what I wrote or how or actually like hides the content of the piece. Upworthy right, style yeah. instead of like enlightens what you were about. like I can't do it. That's like, why I I'm glad it when I, I don't insane. have to write headlines. Yeah, with, yeah. With another problem with BuzzFeed. What's that? Click hole. The onion. Oh, that, that, that oh, that's magical. so good. That's America, has, America has been crying out for click hole. It's a <laughs> yeah. national treasure. That so is good. an amazing tagline. That sounds incredibly dirty. Um, on that note, I really think that we should probably wrap this up. The final, the final thing, 
Um, this is like our longest podcast ever. We have oh, this is terrible. Yeah, what um, form is this going to be available in? Like, how do people? We don't. We talk about that later, Tracy. All right. The final thing is, of course, um, better than politics, which sometimes is the longer segment. But today, I literally just want to hear one or two things, like a couple sentences, what you've been enjoying in the past week that is not related to politics. I basically have just been listening to Old Chrome Edison show bootlegs and rewatching Game of Thrones with my mom. Joe? World Cup. I don't care about any of the politics. I don't care if they destroy the Amazon rainforest. I'm still going to watch it. That's a bummer, but okay. Uh, Josh? Anything? Uh, yeah, I've this week, for whatever reason, I've been watching a lot of, like, Dolphin and whales are intelligent and emotional videos. Nice. On YouTube. <laughs> cool. Fantastic. I also recommend octopus videos because they're awesome. Tracy? All right. You know, I've enjoyed the unseasonably cool June weather, at least in the New York area. Um, oh, I know it. Because yesterday, I think, was the, most, was the first day where you walk outside and you had a sense, okay, I could see this being unbearably hot if I stayed out here too long. But every other day in like, the past week, it's been... Very, very nice weather combination that I feel very grateful for, and it's not that's not politics related, unless yeah. you're talking about harp and weather control and. So <laughs> let's 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 bracket that. That's another. I'm actually gonna do a conspiracy panel at some point. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, <laughs> that was a ridiculously long um panel, but it was a really good one. We had Michelle briefly. I forget if she said anything, but she Did still I? was here for a while, looking stoic. Um, all right, Joe. Uh, Josh and Michael Tracy, thank you very much for um, joining me today. Oh, wait. <sighs> All right, we've gone so long. You know what? Quick, plug your content. Josh, where can people read your works? Go. Latest.com and issuehawk.com. All with Sexy. One word. Okay. <laughs> uh, Michael Tracy, where can the people read your works? Best thing to do would probably be to follow me on Twitter. If you don't want to follow me on Twitter, you could just scan my Twitter for, for updates on various works, but that's where it's all kind of centralized. Awesome. Um, and as always, people can read my stuff on Rare and Anti-War and Vice and the stagblog.com where I usually link to that, the aforementioned sites. Uh, Joe never wants to promote anything, but you should still look at all the shiny websites he makes sometimes, like the Stag blog. Um, my lord, this took a long time. Join us next time, hopefully next week, for Politics for People Who Hate Politics, Episode 6. Um, this panel is too long. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Tracy. Bye, everybody.